It is now time for question period, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first question this morning is uh, to the Premier. Yesterday, Global News, the Toronto Star, Ryerson School of Journalism and others revealed the results of their investigation into contaminated water in our schools and daycares. The results are beyond disturbing. They reveal that over a two-year testing period, there were four, or 646 instances of lead exceeding federal safety regulations in daycares across Ontario. Will the Premier tell Ontarians exactly what he plans to do to bring that number down to zero? Questions to the Premier. The Minister of Environment. Word to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much uh, for that question uh, from the member opposite. Uh, you know, the, uh, we want to thank again the, uh, the journalists that uh, did that study across the entire country, which showed that uh, Ontario was a leader with re regards to reporting and publicly displaying the results across the entire country. Uh, back in 2017, my ministry uh, uh, passed Ontario Regulation 23-07. Uh, which requires all fountains and consumption of taps within our schools and daycares to be tested by 2020. We're pretty close to coming up to completion of that task, which we have an understanding of, of the test results within our schools. If there is a non-compliance going on within our school system, uh, there is a, the public school system must contact the Board of Education. They must contact the Board of Health, they must contact the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, and come up with a plan in order to make those uh, taps safe, whether it be shutting Spons? down those taps in there, bringing in bottled water or doing flushing, but we follow the guidance of the medical officers of health within our regions to come up with those plans. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, in that long list that the minister railed off, I didn't hear him say the word parents one single time. The report reveals that parents of students in schools where dangerous levels of lead have been found have been kept in the dark. Information is not relayed directly to parents whose children uh, are being exposed to toxic levels of lead every day. So will the Premier commit today, then, Speaker, to being proactive and and transparent with parents in Ontario about lead in their children's schools and daycares. Minister, uh, thanks again for that question, Mr. Speaker. And uh, uh, although the data is available publicly, uh, the minister, member opposite is correct that parents aren't directly notified of results. Uh, back in 2017, again, the Ministry of Education sent a, a letter to all boards, uh, school boards throughout the province, that they should look at uh, implementing ways to send those results to parents across uh, the school systems if there are bad test results. Uh, some have complied, some have not. I'm currently uh, speaking with the Minister of Education, who's sitting beside me here, to look to how we can remedy that situation going forward. We know we can do much better. Ontario is a leader, Mr. Speaker, with regards to reporting and testing of the water systems within our, our, our province. We will maintain to be a leader. We will do better. We will do more. And uh, I look forward to our conversation with the Ministry of Education to rectify that situation across the province. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, yesterday's report on water quality in Ontario schools highlights the multi-billion dollar backlog in school repairs. Yesterday, in government estimates hearings, the Minister of Education was forced to admit that the backlog has gone from bad to worse under the Ford government. The repair backlog was $15.9 billion under the Liberals, and now it stands at $16.3 billion dollars. Hardly surprising, since one of the first things this Premier did in office was cut $100 million from school repair budgets. Will the Premier reverse his cuts and immediately fund the necessary school repairs to get the lead out of our children's water? Minister, Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, what we affirmed at the committee yesterday and for all families to hear in the province today is that this government is allocating $13 billion over the next decade to improve schools in every region of the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, what I also made clear is that we're, in, we're maintaining a $1.4 billion allocation to maintain our schools. After 15 years of dereliction of duty, where we had a multi-billion dollar backlog that we inherited, we must do more. We must do more to improve our schools, and Mr. Speaker, we are putting money in the front lines more than ever before to ensure that our schools have the maintenance they need, to ensure that they have the facilities that are conducive to positive learning for all students in the province of Ontario. The next question. 
The member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, yesterday's report highlights schools in the Peel District School Board as having the highest rate of lead in Ontario at a shocking 773 instances. How long will this government continue to expose children in Peel to dangerous levels of, of lead in our school system? Who is the question addressed to? I ask the member for Brampton Centre. Addressed to the Premier. My apologies. Premier. Minister of Environment. Referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you for that uh, question. And uh, We do take our lead results across this province very seriously. I do want to tell Ontarians, I know uh, the members opposite uh, are speaking heavily with regards to their areas of concern, but 99% of our drinking municipal drinking water systems are passing with regards to lead content. 95% of our children's daycare centres and schools are passing with regards to lead content. Now, with regards to uh, issues that arise in schools that where they go beyond the legal uh, uh, limit, that uh, the standard that we've set as a government, there's precautions to put place, like I mentioned earlier, contacting the Board of Education, contacting the local Board of Health, contacting Ministry of Conservation and Parks, and through the Medical Officer of Health, a remediation plan is taken place to ensure that children are not uh, susceptible to that, that water, whether it be closing Response. down the tap system, flushing the system, bringing in bottled water. Plans are put in place to ensure that those schools are safe if they go beyond the lead levels that uh, are currently part of our standard. The supplementary question, the member for Timmins. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my supplementary is to the Premier. This is a major problem across Ontario. It's not just you know, isolated schools. In Timmins, Timmins High and Vocational School, that is owned by DSB1, District School Board No. 1, had tests done where 56 per cent of all the tests came back with results showing levels of lead that exceed the regulations. And in one case, well, one test came back at 100 times over the regulation. So the schools want to know and the school boards want to know, first of all, what are you going to do to help defer the cost that they have to pay in order to flush these lines on a daily basis? And when are you going to provide them with the dollars to fix the water so our children and others in schools are not at risk? Remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The question has been referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And thank you, for, uh, the member Timmins, for that question, Mr. Speaker. And, and, and as I said, we take water safety seriously. This is not an issue that was just created overnight, Mr. Speaker. This is decades and decades due to the fact that uh, the, the province used to build school with lead pipes. Uh, they haven't been replaced yet. The member opposite even sat in his house when he was government. What did he do to replace the lead pipes in the school systems in order to make that fix? Order. We want to work together, Mr. Speaker. We are putting over a half a billion dollars into our school systems in order to fix the situations. We look forward to working with the school systems in order to fix those lead pipes. We are going to continue to be the best in the province at monitoring the lead levels and ensuring our children are safe in our schools, in our daycares, and ensuring that municipalities are below standards so that people across the province can continue to enjoy the water that we hold dear in this province. 99 per cent of municipal tests are, are below the lead standards, and 95 per cent of the schools and daycares are as well. Mr. Speaker, we stand beside our people working day in and day out in our city to keep our water safe, and we'll continue to support them. Thank you. Thank you very much. The member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the Premier. In my riding of Toronto Centre, Inglenook Community School has a 25 per cent failure rate for lead in the water. Speaker, Inglenook Community School is a very special school in my riding. It's a place where many 2S LGBTQ youth find a safe and supportive learning environment. But, Speaker, you cannot thrive in a school where you cannot drink the water. And the World Health Organization confirms that there is no safe level of lead. But with one in four tests done at Inglenook exceeding the recommended levels, the students and staff at the school are in real danger every single day. What is the Premier going to do to make sure that no more lead tests at Inglenook come back over the federally mandated limits? Minister of the Environment, Conservation, Parks. Of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we obviously have a shared commitment to improving the state of facilities in schools in this province. It's why, Mr. Speaker, as noted by the Minister of Environment, 95 percent of schools are meeting that standard, child care in schools. However, we acknowledge there's more to do. It's why we've allocated a historic $13 billion 10-year long-term commitment to provide predictable funding to our school boards to improve capital. Mr. Speaker, the Auditor General of this province in 2015 asked the province to have a 2.5 percent allocation 
when it comes to renewal. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to confirm we are meeting that request. In fact, for the Toronto District School Board, we have a 4 percent commitment being uh, delivered for that school board to ensure that they need that they meet their maintenance needs so that every student in the City of Toronto is able to work and live and be educated in a community that is safe, that is positive and conducive to learning in Ontario. The next question, the member for Kiewetanong. Uh, miigwech, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, que my question is to the Premier. This week is uh, Treaties Recognition Week in Ontario. Across Ontario, people have gathered for treaty awareness events in schools, universities, and public libraries. These events help the public have a better understanding of treaties, as we are all treaty people. First Nations continue to honour our treaties and to share our land and our natural resources. Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear. We never ceded our land to the government entirely, nor did we ever give up our sovereignty as nations. Does Ontario believe it's, it is truly living up to the spirit and intent of the treaties? Miigwech. Members, will please take their seats. The question is addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. Heard to the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question, and I believe all Ontarians, all Canadians, uh, accept that we have more to do when it comes to meeting our commitments to the First Nation, Inuit, Métis people of this country who have made immeasurable contributions. And an important part of that is ensuring the next generation of young people know the history, the shared history and the culture and the diversity of language that exists within the First Nation communities of this province. It's why, Mr. Speaker, our government has expanded and enhanced education learning of First Nation history from grade one to eight. It's why, Mr. Speaker, we've added 10 additional courses in the secondary, uh, for secondary students so that they know more about the incredible contributions of First Nations. We take our responsibilities seriously. We believe that there's a tr tremendous economic op opportunity and potential within our First Nations community, a fast-growing community in this province. We're gonna continue to work with them in good faith to to ensure that they're able to reach their full potential, get economic opportunity, realize the dreams that this country should be able to provide for the first Response. peoples of this country. Thank you. Supplementary question. Treaties are more than contracts and real estate transactions. Actually, they are sacred agreements that set out for us on how to maintain our relationship with newcomers then and now. The Crown has a role to play in this relationship, too. First Nations cannot be the only ones holding up their side of the treaty. We come to you and ask for help in getting clean drinking water, safe housing, and proper infrastructure. If Ontario honoured the treaties as they were intended, we, I wouldn't, we wouldn't be asking these questions. Is the government, is Ontario, are you prepared to share the resources as part of Treaty Number no. 9 and the Robinson Treaties, yes or no? The Minister to reply to the Attorney General. Refer to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise and, and, and address the members' issues. Uh, we, we all agree, and, and those who know the history of the Williams Treaties in, in central Ontario understand how some in the past things have not always worked the way that they should be, and that there should be a level of respect, and that we should come to agreement on some of the fundamental uh, important pieces. But it's not just a piece of paper. It's not just a discussion. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's, about, it's about action coming out of that, and so uh, that is why uh, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and myself were in Kenora recently talking about the justice centres, uh, standing with Treaty 3 and, and Chief Fiddler and Nan, uh, talking about the important work that we need to do with First Nations to actualize the agreements that we have, to make sure that they're having an impact in the communities where they need to. And so I, I'm pleased to work with the member on issues as they arise to make sure 
that we're taking action where action is needed in ways that we can, and to work with our federal counterparts as well to make sure that this is a holistic approach to the issues and not just singular uh, motion with no action. We, we are committed to action, and the Minister of Indigenous Affairs uh, talks consistently about levels of response respect and engagement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Premier, as you know, we have an amazing country, in particular our own province. We are truly blessed with an abundant natural resources and world-class citizens who are the enemy of the world itself. Thanks to our government's leadership, we are finally turning this country's economy around, putting in place policies that will help all Ontarians thrive. Unfortunately, we can only do so much. Interprovincial trade barriers act as hurdles that divide this country and make us less competitive. Can you speak, Premier, to the impact that interprovincial trade barriers have had on our potential economic output and what our government is doing to address these burdensome regulations? Questions addressed to the Premier. For you, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank our great MPP from Sarnia Lambton for the question. Absolute champion. The, the, the impact, Mr. Speaker, on interprovincial trade regulations are staggering, a major roadblock to economic growth right across this region. The Canadian Chamber of Commerce, Mr. Speaker, previously called the interprovincial trade regulations, and I'll quote, a tyranny of small variances. The Senate Committee of Banking and Commerce stated that regulatory overlap and negatively impacts the cost of Canadian economy up to $130 billion. Wow. We're working at the, the COF meeting, we're working to tear down those barriers to make sure that we can trade freely across this country. And what it comes down to, Mr. Speaker, is just regulation over regulation that's putting a burden on, on trade. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. And back to the Premier. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Premier, those are some astonishing numbers and speak to how action is needed and needed right away. We are seeing an increased episode of division and uncertainty in this country that's on, on before. Addressing economic trade barriers should be the top of mind for all of our leaders. Our country is strengthened by ensuring goods and services are able to move through this federation with minimal disruption. At a time of increased protectionism, in this world. We should be doing all we can to help ensure that our companies and entrepreneurs have all the support they require. Premier, can you speak to Ontario's role in helping to bridge this divide on this issue? Premier. I would like to thank our, our great MPP. As we saw, Mr. Speaker, in the last election and after the election, this country is divided. It's an Ontario spot to stand up unite the party, unite the country, I should say, right across all provinces. Order. And thank you for the cheers. And uh, unite the country right across this, this uh, great uh, country, Mr. Speaker. Again, there, we've offered Toronto to host the cough meeting. If the chair accepts, we will come here because what is good for Canada is good for Ontario, Mr. Speaker. What's good for Ontario is good for Canada. We will unite this country, and united we stand, divided we fall, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier made comments about my hometown, the city of Hamilton. Question period gets pretty partisan sometimes, and it can get pretty heated. But yesterday, the Premier insulted an entire community. It's bad enough Order. for the Premier of Ontario to call any part of the province destroyed. But when he attacks my hometown, the great city of Hamilton, we take it personally. Is the Premier ready to Apologize. Questions addressed to the Premier. For, for you, Mr. Speaker, as, as the uh, member from, from Hamilton heard, it wasn't about the great people of Hamilton because they're incredible. They're starving for jobs, and we have a great MPP that's actually, for the first time, bringing jobs to Hamilton. We have an investment of $100 million from DHL. 
We have three or four companies going there and investing. Do you know why they're investing, Mr. Speaker? Because they love our policies. They love that we're tearing down the regulations and red tape. They love the idea of us giving $5 billion of tax credits to encourage businesses, to create the environment for Hamilton to thrive and prosper and grow. For the first time, I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, Hamilton has a voice with our great MPP sitting up there, attracting businesses right in the leader's backyard, and the leader didn't even Response. know about the expansion of DHL. The supplementary question. Hamilton is filled with some of the hardest working people you will ever meet. They didn't inherit million dollar companies from their parents. Instead, they work Order. hard to Order. pay their bills and take Order. care of their families, which, Order. by the way, is getting harder and harder every day under this government. Order. Hamiltonians deserve better than a premier insulting their town and trying to take credit for the good things that they built before this premier was in that seat. If the premier is really interested in helping Hamilton, he could stop firing our teachers and in our schools and nurses in our hospitals. Is he ready to do that? Order. The Premier to reply. Mr. Speaker, the NDP actually have no policies whatsoever. They, their policies would decimate job creation in the city of Hamilton. That's the legacy of NDP governments, Mr. Speaker. Mind you, there's only been one NDP government in the province of Ontario because the people of Ontario have never wanted to go back to that misery, Mr. Speaker. What they do, though, Mr. Speaker, is because they don't have any policies to talk about, they go personal. So if you've worked hard, you've earned it and made a good living, they talk you down, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the people of Hamilton are like all of the people of the province of Ontario, like my parents who came here, worked very hard. They came with nothing, like a number of members of our caucus. They made something of themselves, and instead of talking down to those people who have worked Order. so very hard to make something of themselves, how about you do what we Respond. do? Celebrate them and celebrate the fact that there are a lot of jobs for the people of Ontario and across the province. Stop. Members, please take your seats. Order. The House will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, uh, Speaker. But, Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. It disappoints me to have to ask, but it's far too important not to, and it deserves a considered response. There are thousands of honest, reputable builders in Ontario, but there are some bad players. The Tarion audit revealed that nearly 10,000 people were ripped off by Tarion on def defects in their homes. Builders refused to fix another 4,000 homes. Staff are often unqualified and provide false information. And executives line their very deep pockets while protecting bad builders. Three audits by the Auditor General and the report by Justice Cunningham have all revealed the same thing. We all know what the problem is. Money is more important than the little guy. Speaker, will the minister ans answer this? Is Terion a warranty regulator or a protection racket? The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question very much because it allows us the opportunity to stand up and talk about what our government is doing for the little people that the member alluded to be just moments ago because uh, the people in Ontario, whether they're buying a home or buying a condo, it doesn't matter what size of home, it's the most important investment that they make in their lives. And we want to make sure that there are rules in place to, to protect them. And I think the biggest thing we need to do in Ontario is after after 15 years of dismal, absolutely a dismal record on this issue, we want to make sure that we can educate Ontarians because, first and foremost, Tarion 
does not provide warranty. The builders provide insurance. And so we recognize straight away that we need to ensure that consumers are educated with what is needed in terms of priority decisions when they're entertaining buying a condo or a home. I'm pleased Response. to share with you that we accepted readily the Auditor General's report on October 30th, and we're moving forward. And in fact, in terms of compensation, I used my own minister powers to make sure that executive compensation was disclosed. Thank you. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Again, to the minister. Well, tens of thousands of people have been ripped off by Tarion under the Liberal administration. It continues today. Despite the minister's tinkering, yesterday in this House, she stated that, I quote, homeowners have had the rug pulled out from underneath them, end quote. Tarion remains an unaccountable rogue agency that is engaged in corrupt business practices. It's also controlled by an association that has contributed vast amounts of money to all political parties. Speaker, people need answers. Has the ministry been cautioned or directed by current or former political operatives to turn a blind eye and keep their hands off Tarion? And Speaker, will the minister make public her mandate letter to dispel these concerns of political interference. Let's put an end to Question. this protection racket. <laughs> Minister to reply. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you with absolute certainty that our government is standing by homeowners. I can tell you with absolute certainty, certainty that stemming back to the very thoughtful watch from Minister Smith and Minister Walker, we have been taking progressive steps to make sure that we're protecting homeowners and we're making sure that the executives that have been spoke about by the member opposite are actually stepping up and doing the right thing. I'm pleased to share with you that just yesterday, my ministry, we received a letter from the board, the board chair, the, and he is absolutely confirming that they are moving forward on the requests that we have made to make Tarion more accountable, to make Tarion absolutely a body that is in, in taking care of our homeowners, be it first-time new buyers for homes Response. or condos, because both of those opportunities have to be protected when it comes to that very important decision and investing in a home. So again, we've acted on Justice Cunningham's 20, uh, recommendations, 27 to be specific. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question. The member for Perth Wellington. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My, minister, uh, my question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Reduction. Minister, between our mining sector, forestry industry, and energy policy, we know that Northern Ontario is responsible for billions of dollars of economic activity and tens of thousands of jobs related to our rich supply of natural resources. Hard-working Northern Ontarians are doing more than their fair share helping to build Ontario. Could the minister tell this House what is in the package concerning Northern Ontario's critical mining industry? Questions to the Associate Minister of Small Business and Red Tape Production. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Perth Wellington for all of his advocacy for job creators across the province. Here, here. The member is 100 per cent right that Northern Ontario's growth and economic development is key to Ontario's success. And Mr. Speaker, our plan is working. Under the leadership of Premier Ford and the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, we have helped create an environment for over 272,000 new jobs in the province of Ontario in the past 15 months. Mining is a key part of Ontario's economy. The mining industry accounted for nearly $10 billion worth of minerals in 2017, creates more than 26,000 direct jobs and 50,000 indirect jobs in Ontario. That's why we are making common sense changes to make mining more competitive in Ontario. Here, here. Uncertainty and open-ended timelines have been making it harder for mining operations in Ontario. We are proposing 45-day guarantees to make sure mining can be more competitive and continue driving more investment in Northern Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank the, I want to thank the minister for that answer. Mining is not only a major part of the North's economic development, but is also critical for Ontario's bottom line. 
Could the minister tell us what other ways this package proposes to support job creation and economic growth in Northern Ontario? Minister to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In addition to providing certainty for our mining sector, we are proposing measures to help our forestry sector. Ontario's forestry industry generates over $16 billion in revenue and supports approximately 155,000 direct and indirect jobs. Today, forestry companies are caught up in duplicative approval processes that cost time and money to industry. Mr. Speaker, these delays have caused many of these forestry operations to close. Our package proposes to streamline approvals for our forest operations by ending, ending unnecessary duplication in the process. It's about making common sense regulatory changes and getting out of the way of job creators so they can do what they do best, create good opportunities for hardworking families across the province. Mr. Speaker, Response. we are making Ontario more competitive and we look forward to building on Ontario and making it the economic engine of Canada once again and building on the 272,000 jobs that we have been able to create since being elected. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question, the member from Ashkegawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To the Premier. This week, Ontario is celebrating National Skill Trades and Technology Week. While the government is busy patting themselves on the back, their cuts to education are robbing youth, young people, of the opportunity they need to get into the trades. Schools have had to cancel construction and technology classes, and one school completely scrapped their youth apprenticeship program. Speaker, no matter how hard the minister tries to spin, it, this cancellation means only one thing, fewer opportunities for students to learn about the skilled trades. When is this government going to res uh, reverse their cuts and stop making life harder for those who want to enter into the skill phase? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. And referred to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I was proud to stand with uh, the Minister of Labour, Skills Training, the Minister of Children and Youth last week, along with the Parliamentary Assistant for Education, where we announced a historic investment in the highs in, in the skilled trades. An additional 50,000 students this year are benefiting from our investment. Over 10 million more dollars this year to send more young people to enter the skilled trades, to enter the apprenticeship, and the high-paying, dignified jobs that exist within this sector. Mr. Speaker, we know the one in five jobs will soon be in the skilled trades. We appreciate in remote regions of this province, in the north, in the south, east and west, in every region, we know that there's a supply issue of labour talent in this country. We are working hard to skill up this province and incent young people to see themselves, particularly underrepresented groups and women, so they can see themselves pursuing these wonderful, dignified, high-paying jobs. We're, we've announced 120 additional programs benefiting 50,000 students, over 2,000 schools, and we know, Mr. Speaker, there's more to do. Response. We're going to continue to work together to ensure more young people enter this critical sector of the economy. Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, this minister can say anything he wants about his so-called investment in education. He also said not one teacher would lose their job, and we know that wasn't true either. The Ontario Public uh, School Board has asked the member to withdraw. They're, they're cut. Oh, sorry. Withdraw. The Ontario Public School Board Association warned the government that their cuts mean that there will be very limited opportunities for students interested in the, in the skilled trades. And one school also has already scrapped the specialist high-skill major, a program designed to help kids interested in the trades and trades get jobs. Again, to the Premier. Is it not, it's not just students who are going to suffer under the cuts to education, our economy will, will as well. Why does this Premier not think Ontario deserves better? Minister of Education. The Minister of Labour. Referred to the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I will say uh, the only thing that the member opposite had correct in his question is that this week is National Skilled Trades and Technology Week uh, in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, uh, with the Minister of Education and right across the government, we're providing more opportunities uh, to young people uh, right through our education system to uh, explore that opportunity of getting uh, a great job in the skilled trades. Mr. Speaker, uh, my friend, someone I work uh, very closely with, uh, Arlene Dunn, who is the Canadian Building Trades Union Director, uh, recently said to me, Mr. Speaker, that we are going to be short 
260,000 skilled trades jobs in the next 10 years across Canada. Mr. Speaker, uh, a lot of these uh, jobs pay over $100,000 per year. Mr. Speaker, that's why we continue to uh, educate Response. our students, talk to parents, talk to guidance counselors about the hope and opportunity uh, in the skilled trades right here in Ontario. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much. Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. Monday marked the start of Crime Prevention Week in Ontario, an opportunity to highlight how the public can work and support our frontline police officers and first responders in preventing crime. Now, more than ever, criminals rely on increasingly complex methods to victimize law-abiding people and to evade capture. In addition, in communities like mine and across the province, we hear stories of young people caught in a cycle of violence often leading to criminal activity. Speaker, can the Solicitor General tell this House how the police services are working with the public and community partners to prevent crime and why these partnerships are so vital? Solicitor General. Thank you. And thank you to the member from Willowdale. You know, he's absolutely right. The, uh, the opportunity that we are having today during Crime Prevention Week, uh, as we mark it with preventing crime, prote protecting people, and having the police association uh, join us here in an education day is important because it is not just our police services that protect us, Speaker. It is citizens, it is community groups, it is the engagement that we need and we expect from our leaders in all uh, areas, whether it's in education or our workforces. Um, I trust and I hope that members opposite and across uh, all political spectrums are meeting with their police services members today uh, because they can share some very true um, depictions of how we can make a difference to make their job uh, easier and our communities ultimately safer. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. Thank you, and Speaker, through you, thank you to the Minister for that response. I know all of us agree on the importance of preventing crime in our neighbourhoods. Many of our communities have faced increased gun and gang violence recently, which I know is a concern for all of us in this House. Tackling the scourge of gun and gang violence is a key priority that requires the support of many of our government's ministries, including the Solicitor General, the Attorney General, and the Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services. Through you, can the Solicitor General please tell us what actions our government is taking to prevent and tackle gun and gang violence in our communities? Again, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Willowdale. Now, it, uh, it really is a multi-ministerial, all-government uh, all approach, um, and working with our partners uh, in with the Police Association of Ontario, with the Ontario Chiefs of Police, uh, we have some very concrete uh, ideas that they have brought forward and we are moving forward on. Um, of course, guns and gangs do not limit themselves to municipal boundaries. And so our investment of $16 million to develop a comprehensive province-wide strategy to tackle guns and gang violence including, includes meaningful intervention and prevention for at-risk and gang-involved youth. Uh, tough and enforcement, suppression and prosecution for serious offenders. These are all pieces that we are working on because we are listening to the feedback from our frontline officers. And if I may, I would like to invite the Response. members of the POA who are here today for our lobby day to join the Premier and I in his uh, office after question period to continue that conversation and thank you for your service. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Yesterday, 11,000 scientists worldwide, including scientists here in Ontario, signed on to a statement calling on governments to recognize that we are facing a climate emergency. Ontarians are already feeling the impact of that climate crisis, from people facing floods on the Great Lake to First Nations communities forced to evacuate because of wildfires. Ontario has to be a leader taking on this climate crisis. We are. Will the Premier reverse course today? Will he join new Democrats, scientists, youth, and governments around the world and declare a climate emergency here in this province? Premier. Minister of Environment. Refer to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much for that question opposite, Mr. Speaker, and we do take our work and 
and fighting climate change and ensuring we have a healthy environment very seriously to this side of the House. Last year, we proposed a draft environmental plan for the province of Ontario and started implementing some of those uh, processes as we go forward. Uh, it's good to mention that uh, we've uh, put uh, forth our mission performance standards to the federal government, which will target large emitters of greenhouse gases in this province. We're waiting whether or not the federal government will accept those results, but what that will do, we'll lower the, make sure that the polluters at the highest level are lowering their emissions over time. We're going to be coming out with our, our new heavy uh, truck uh, emissions program, which will uh, uh, target the diesel trucks that are on our roadways to lower their emissions, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, changed the mandate for renewable uh, additives to gasoline. Ethanol will go up to 15% in our gasoline Spons. by 2020. And we've started our work towards uh, renewing our recycling program in this province. We'll divert organic waste and, and plastics away from our, our landfills and ensure that we create the new circuit. Thank you very much. <laughs> the supplementary question. Speaker, again to the Premier, I hope he considers this an important question. It's time to get real. It's time to listen to people. It's time to listen to the science. Time to get to work on a plan for actually addressing the climate crisis. What and what was just listed off is not going to deal with what we're facing. We all know that. It's time to stop throwing public money at a failing court case. That is a waste. It's time to stop pretending that inaction or minor action is a solution. Time to get work building a prosperous and low-carbon Ontario. Here, here. Will the Premier commit today to reversing course and coming up with a real plan to tackle the climate crisis? Members, please take your seats. The question has been referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, we are taking our role in the environment very seriously. Ontario leads the way with reducing greenhouse gas emissions 22 per cent below 2005 levels, and we continue on that process, Mr. Speaker. We've also uh, uh, done other things with our plan that are working towards a healthy and clean environment, Mr. Speaker. We've issued a $950 million green bond to capitalize on the province's ability to raise funds at low interest rates to go towards public transit initiatives, extreme weather infrastructure, energy efficiency, and conservation projects, Mr. Speaker. We've uh, waited for the report from the Special Division on flooding. What is missing through the conversations over the years in this province, Mr. Speaker, is resilience and adaptation to climate change. We've incorporated that into our plan to fight climate change. Not only are we going to deal with the causes of climate change and the high emissions in this province, we're also going to work with municipalities and individuals to ensure that they're able to adapt uh, and become more resilient to the changes in climate change, Mr. Speaker, because we're taking our job seriously with regards to the environment. We will build a healthy economy, and we'll balance that with a healthy environment. Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Perth Wellington. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. Speaker, the data economy offers tremendous opportunities for companies based in Ontario to develop data driven business models and unlock the commercial value of data. Creating jobs and growing businesses is a central part of how our government is improving the lives of Ontarians each and every day with the ever-growing potential, ever potential of a data-driven economy. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House how the government is helping to promote trust and confidence in the protection and use of public data while stimulating the economic growth? The Minister of Government and Consumer Services. And I would like to thank the member from Perth Wellington for the question as I really appreciated his participation in a seminar and consultation that we hosted last week in Stratford because I have to share with the House, as the member alluded to, data is a resource that has limitless potential, but we need to be very thoughtful as to how we move forward with it. And that's why I'm very pleased to share that our government is developing a provincial data strategy, first of its kind in Canada, that will help Ontarians and businesses alike to benefit directly from the data economy. But uh, assuring all the while they could be confident in personal privacy and cybersecurity. To accomplish this goal, we have done many things. We're hosting online and in-person consultations. We've released three consultation papers that we're soliciting feedback on, and we've also Response. pulled together an all-star task force, a digital and data task force made up of industry and academic experts that are really interested in, in helping us uh, hone our 
our consultations to address the thoughtfulness that needs to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, and I want to thank the minister for her answer and for joining me at the first Rural Roundtable in Stratford on Ontario's data strategy last week. I know many Ontarians will be gl very glad to hear of the action of the minister, that, or of the actions the minister has taken to ensure that businesses and members of communities across the province are, giving the, are given the opportunity to work with our government as it builds its data strategy. Mr. Speaker, as part of the development of the data strategy, our government recently launched its third discussion paper on the theme of smarter, better government. Can the minister tell this House what our government is doing to make government better utilizing? Can the minister tell this House what our government is doing to make government better utilize data to improve services for the people of Ontario? And what is our government doing to make uh, government data more open and giving Ontarians more control over their own data? Minister. Again, thank you very much to the member from Perth Wellington for that question. And our goal is to make sure that we're we're chipping away and breaking down data silos because we're serving Ontarians best when they only have to tell their story once. And so our goal is for Ontarians to trust the cyber and the opportunities that are going to be presented to them. We've been studying the top 10 services at on Service Ontario, for example, and we're moving those top 10 services online. So again, there, Ontarians will not be experiencing those long lineups that we see across the province. And you know, it's going to be easy for Ontarians to access their stickers for their licenses, their driver's licenses, or their health cards. Most importantly, we're listening because, again, this is a journey that is going to revolutionize the manner in which we govern and we're being very thoughtful and listening to the Response. concerns and the opportunities that we're hearing from our, our Ontarians be their academics experts or somebody who just wants to make sure that their personal information is safe and secure thank you very much the next question the member for Spadina Fort York Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Today, thousands of students at universities across the province are walking out of their classrooms to protest this government's cuts to OSAP. I've had students call my office in tears who, thanks to this government's cuts, could not afford to return to school this year. I've talked to others who are working full-time jobs while studying full-time because their OSAP grants and loans were cut in half. Premier, students should be spending their time studying, not worrying about making ends meet. Will you do the right thing and stop this attack on students and re reverse these reckless cuts? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Refer to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and to the member for the question. We're all aware that uh, changes were made by the previous government to the OSAP system uh, before the last election, in fact, on the eve of the last election, Mr. Speaker. And those changes that were made were principally made in a fashion in which these changes allowed students to access OSAP that came from higher income families, and they were receiving grants. Now, the Auditor General has reviewed the changes that were made, and she noted that OSAP had increased by over $2 billion within the first year. It got so expensive, Mr. Speaker, that it wasn't sustainable any longer. We needed to protect the future of OSAP for future generations. That is what we've done, Mr. Speaker. Not only have we protected it for future generations, Response. but we've also reduced tuition by 10%, yeah, yeah. saving students more money, keeping money in their pockets so that they can get the education they need. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the students who were not able to return to school this year because of your OSAP cuts do not feel protected by this government. The Liberal government did double tuition fees in this province and then, as an act of penitence, tried to, to increase OSAP. 
but now your government has actually cut it by $670 million. And not only that, they have jeopardized funding for student food banks, for women's centres, for LGBTQ centres on campus. Given that the minister received over 3,000 letters from students begging this government to reverse this heartless decision, it is clear that these cuts are making life worse for students and families across the province. Why does the Premier think that students don't deserve the financial support they need to access college and university while this government squanders money on lucrative appointments for friends and family? That's right. That's right. Minister reply. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Again, if you don't want to take it from us, listen to the Auditor General. $2 billion in the first year. $2.7 billion within the next three years. That's double the cost of the OSAP system, double over budget. It was not sustainable. We needed to protect it for future generations, Mr. Speaker. These changes had to be done to ensure that we would still have OSAP for our students. What we've done now is reduced tuition by 10 percent, saving students $450 million wow. across the province, Mr. Speaker. And that's not for a single student. That is every single student across this province will see those savings, Mr. Speaker. That is a significant savings for students. We're keeping money in their pockets and making sure that they have access to high quality Response. education. The education they need, Mr. Speaker, and the education that they deserve. And we're making sure that OSAP is there for the students who need it most. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barry Ennisville. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the minister who inspires women and young people today, the Minister of Children and Youth Issues. In Ontario, as we know, uh, women make up 48 per cent of our labour force. Yes, we can do better. For far too often, women are underrepresented in science, technology, math and engineering. We can do better, and in fact, women make up less than 4 per cent of skills trades labour the skills trade labour force. Yes, Mr. Speaker, we can do better. Unfortunately, among those that who work in those sectors, we often, they're often concentrated in part-time, low-paying or administrative roles. With so many satisfying high-paying jobs in these sectors, we can do better and something needs to change. So I wanted to ask the minister if she can inform this House what our government is doing to ensure that women are represented in all aspects of the growing STEM economy. The Associate Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barrie Innisfil for that question. It's a great opportunity to always talk about what our government is doing for skilled trades in Ontario. Speaker, by 2021, one in five jobs in Ontario will be in the skilled trades. And with so many people retiring in the coming years, the need for skilled labour is ever increasing. This also means that we need more young people in skilled trades in STEM. And who better to join such a rewarding sector than women? Speaker, we need more women in the skilled trades in STEM. Here, here. Women like Nagin, who I met yesterday with the Associate Minister of Energy, or Julia, who I visited on her construction site. Nagin is an engineer for Ontario Power Generation, and Julia is a site supervisor for BridgeCon Construction. Both of these women add so much value to their companies that allows them and the company to grow and to thrive. I want to thank all of my colleagues for working to end stigma Response. around the trades and let all Ontarians, especially women, know that Ontario is open for skilled trade jobs and open for skilled trade business. The supplementary question. Thank you uh, to the minister for that answer. I know this topic is a very passionate subject for the minister, and I congratulate her on all her hard work. I know she's been working all summer meeting with different organizations and people who care to get more women into the workforce, give women a hand up when it comes to being in the workforce, and also pursuing the skills trades. Yesterday, I noticed that the minister had been meeting with PARO and the WYCA in Toronto, and was talking about all the great work that they have been doing to make sure they're providing more opportunities for women in the skills trades and for them to enter the workforce. So I was wondering if the minister could highlight some of the other groups and individuals that she's been speaking to and working so hard with to encourage more women to pursue such important sectors like our skills trades. The Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank you again to the member for your question. Speaker, women's earnings are crucial to the well-being and financial stability of their families. That is why we are working hard to let young women and girls know that skilled trades and technology 
are not just for boys. This means making women and girls aware of the opportunities in these sectors and providing the right training to help them succeed in their studies and their careers. One organization that is actively working to promote skilled trades for all students, but especially young women, is Kick-Ass Careers, founded by Pat Williams and Jamie McMillan, who I introduced earlier in the gallery. Jamie is a journeyman iron worker boiler maker. Through her organization, Kick-Ass Careers, she works hard to take her success in the skilled trades field and teach girls and young women how rewarding a career like hers can be. I'm honoured to meet with her this Response. afternoon after question period and talk about the future and what we can do to get more females involved in the skilled trades and technology sectors. Thank you. The next question, the member for Windsor to come see. Thank you, Speaker. My question was to the Premier or the Deputy Premier, I guess, to the Acting Premier. Uh, good morning, all. Speaker, before the election, the uh, Premier promised to help those involved with harness horse racing because they've been put under the thumb of the well-connected Woodbine Entertainment Group by the previous Liberal government. But instead of helping the Harness Horse Association, the Premier is watching Woodbine squeeze them even further. In April, Ontario Racing stopped funding the Ontario Harness Horse Association and told its 3,000 members to join a rival association that is controlled by Woodbine, thousands of jobs connected to local tracks and communities such as Leamington, Dresden, London and Sarnia are now at risk. Will the Premier or the Acting Premier intervene to reverse this decision and restore funding to the OHHA? The government to respond. I recognize the member or the, the president of the Treasury Board. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I rise for the first time in this session, so I welcome all members back to the House. Uh, and, and thank you to the member opposite for a very important question. Uh, you know, the benefits for the horse racing industry are entirely managed by the horse racing industry themselves. So, as a result. The association representing the horse racing industry across the province is leading this transition, and we've encouraged everyone in the Ontario racing community to sit down with all parties in order to develop a workable solution. Um, we remain committed to the success of the horse racing industry, Mr. Speaker. I will also remind the members opposite that our government has taken clear Order. action to support rural communities through new investments to help the province's horse racing industry create and protect jobs. And Mr. Speaker, as has been mentioned Response. many times, we will continue to commit to creating the conditions for lots of good jobs in this province, and we'll have more to say in the supplementary. The supplementary question. Speaker, grooms, trainers, drivers, owners, and breeders should be free to choose their own representatives. They should not be forced to join an organization controlled by a powerful Toronto-based corporation that wants them silenced and gone. Right on. Rural communities in Ontario count on the thousands of jobs provided by the horse racing industry. Will the Premier, the President of the Treasury Board, the Finance Minister, the Attorney General and everybody else meet with the OHHA, stop the attack on rural Ontario, reverse Ontario's racing unilateral decision? and allow those in harness racing to decide for themselves who can best represent their interests. Members, take their seats. Again, the President of the Treasury Board to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, uh, we're going to harness every opportunity um, to, uh, to— Sure. I thought I might, uh, I might get a little bit of levity, but no, I guess not, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, our, our government— Apologize to the minister. He may reply. Mr. Speaker, you know our government is uh, reversing the damage done to the horse racing industry by the previous Liberal government. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, yeah. Yeah. You know, for example, our optional slots at racetracks program is returning slots and providing increased to support to eligible racetracks. Because, Mr. Speaker, unlike the others, we understand the importance of horse racing to our local communities, and that is why we continue to support the industry, Mr. Speaker. But let me tell you what we, uh, what we plan to do. 
We inherited the largest subnational debt in the history of this province. Mr. Speaker, we inherited a massive deficit. Later on today, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Finance will talk about how we continue the positive work to create the opportunities for Ontarians to create jobs so that we can have all those people that want to work in this great province will continue to have a job and join the 272,000 that have already got jobs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. In September, I had the pleasure of joining the Minister for a tour of Cinespace, one of the many production companies that make their home right in my riding of Etobicoke Lakeshore. During her visit, we toured the set of Umbrella Academy, a Netflix hit based on the comic book series of the same name which I binge-watched the next couple of days, and it was an excellent production. <laughs> According to Netflix, this Toronto production provides up to 1,850 local jobs each and every year through their investment. And we had the opportunity to meet the caterer who said, you know what, I just live down the street and I can drive up here to work every day, and it's great to see the local jobs and people get to live right in their community. Mr. Speaker, could, you, uh, could the minister please update the House on the value of the film, television and creative industries and what they do and what they bring to our province? Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Cultural Industries. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for my first question as the new minister and the first minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries that fuels a spectacular double bottom line. That is first to preserve and protect our cultural fabric, as we do in storytelling, as well as looking at the economic imprint, a $71 billion economic imprint within this ministry. The member opposite, or the member is right. It fuels a $1.9 billion economy in film and uh, television and creates hundreds of thousands of jobs. Speaker, I say that we are the world in one province. Province, and next week I'll have the opportunity to showcase Ontario to the rest of the world as I join the Canadian Film Centre Music Canada, uh, the uh, M Motion Picture Association of Canada, and so many more in LA as we meet with executive, senior executives of Apple TV, Universal, Netflix, Disney, NBC, and so many more so that we can continue Response. to grow the bottom line for these job creators. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister. I look forward to seeing what comes of your trip and the opportunities it presents for Ontarians as you show international conglomerates that our government is truly open for business. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, last week the minister spoke to the Economic Club of Canada on her ministry's dual bottom line. The Ministry of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries is an economic powerhouse, contributing billions of dollars to our economy and hundreds of thousands of jobs. Can the minister tell us how she's leveraging this expanded portfolio to protect and preserve our cultural heritage while growing the minister's, ministry's total economic imprint? Minister to respond. Thank you very much, Speaker. Again, I'd like to thank the member uh, for her question, in drawing a, a very important distinction that we have within the ministry when we combine heritage culture, sport, and tourism, as well as industry. We recognize, as Ontarians, that they contribute to over $71 billion in economic activity. And when they're creating jobs and putting paychecks in people's pocket, well, then we can build and protect on what matters most, and that is our health care and our education and our infrastructure. This ministry combined allows for about $12 billion in, gener in uh, re revenues for the government of Ontario. And next week, when I'm in Los Angeles, I can't wait to speak to more job creators, as well as those creators who are creating amazing talent in the province of Ontario. Looking forward to it, Speaker, and looking forward to working with the member. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. I understand the member for Guelph has a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm seeking unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding independent members' responses to ministerial statements. Member Guelph is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to put forward a motion without notice regarding independent members' responses to ministerial statements. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Again, I recognize the member for Guelph. I move that notwithstanding Standing Order 35E, the Green Independent Member and the Liberal Independent Member for Ottawa South split the time allocated for responses for independent members on today's ministerial statement by the Minister of Finance. Shriners move that notwithstanding Standing Order 35E, the Green Independent Member and the Liberal Independent Member for Ottawa South split the time allocated for responses for independent members on today's ministerial statement by the Minister of Finance. 
Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion carry? Carry. Carry. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.